Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. Attention. Good afternoon. My name is James Vacker and I'm chair of the New York City Council Committee on Technology and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's hearing. We are here to discuss the open data plan of 2017 in addition to two new bills aimed at strengthening the open data law and ensuring its continuation. New York City offers an immense number of services and resources to residents, and when people take advantage of these services, they are inevitably involved in the creation of data. This data is fundamental to the city's operations, and it's also important that people have access to the data. Access to government information ensures public institutions can be held accountable. In New York City, the importance of public access to data is reflected in both law and practice. In 2012, New York City became the first municipality in the country to mandate that all non-confidential government data be made available online in machine-readable formats. Since then, the Council has passed seven amendments strengthening and updating this law, and the Open Data Team has worked diligently to ensure citywide compliance with the law. Under the Open Data Law, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications is required to publish an annual Open Data Compliance Plan, and for the previous three years, I have convened oversight hearings on the plan. Today, Community. This year's open data plan demonstrates that the city has continued improving the open data portal and made significant steps toward increased public engagement. In the past year, the council has created a new and improved open data website for which they leveraged cutting edge human centered design methods. The open portal has seen 170 new data sets added. 38 data sets automated and has engaged an average of 140,000 users per month. The open data team has also held a number of well-attended community events. Still, while there has been tremendous success, maintenance of the open data portal and coordination between every city agency is, by its very nature, a massive undertaking. Issues are bound to arise, some of which we will discuss today. Additionally, as technology advances and agencies become more experienced with the intricacies of data publication, there are several ways we can improve current law. Over the past year, my office, along with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, convened a number of stakeholders to solicit feedback, and introduction 1707 resulted from these conversations. A portion of the new legislation reflects currently, current agency practice encoding it into law and preventing any future administrations from making changes. The open data law currently states that agencies should publish data sets be before December 31st, 2018, and if data cannot be made public, an explanation should be provided. Intro 1707 will extend this deadline to 2021, thereby offering agencies more time to comply. Another provision in Intro 1707 will change the timeline for the compliance plan, pushing it from July to September. The purpose of this is to better accommodate the internal processes of agencies and the open data team. This legislation will also require that the head of each agency designates an employee to serve as the open data coordinator responsible for ensuring that such an agency complies with the open data law and receives feedback from the public. This will codify a current provision in the current technical standards manual. 
Additionally, this legislation mandates that the department review the technical standards manual every two years and provide a method for public comment. Lastly, the legislation requires DOIT to collect and publish data on the web portal codifying a current departmental practice. In addition to 1707, we will be, di we will be discussing another piece of legislation which I introduced, Intro 1528. Currently, agencies must review freedom of information law responses, which include the release of data and determine if the response consists of data that has not already been included on the open data portal and to report on the statistics of these responses to the compliance plan. In the compliance plan, 1528 will require that the compliance plan also includes the names of any data sets provided in response to FOIA requests that are not included on the open data portal. The two bills we're hearing today are a priority for this committee and I'm looking forward to moving these forward in the next few months. I want to thank our committee counsel, Malika Jabali and policy analyst Patrick Mulville for their hard work as always in serving this committee and I want to thank my legislative director, Zach Heck, as well. Um, I, f I was going to call upon the Manhattan Borough President to speak first, but I don't think she's here yet. Uh, we're joined by members of the committee, Council Member Barry Gredenchik to my right, Councilman Joseph Borelli, he's really to my right, uh, Council Member Annabelle Palmer, <laughs> Council Member Annabelle Palmer as well. Okay, so why don't we call the administration. James Perazzo of Moda, Albert Wenner of Do It. Weber, I'm sorry, your handwriting. That's okay. <laughs> I shouldn't talk, it's okay. Um, I have to swear, I won't be swearing at you, I'll be swearing you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Who would like to proceed? Please introduce yourself for the record. James Perazzo. Good afternoon. My name is James Perazzo, Deputy Director for Strategic Management at the Mayor's Office of Operations and Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, also known as MODA. I'm joined by Albert Weber, Director of Open Data at the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. We are here today to speak about the way MODA and DOIT have worked together over the last year to fulfill the requirements of the city's open data law and implement the administration's open data for all vision. On behalf of the administration, I'd like to extend gratitude to this committee under the leadership of Chair Vaca for the attention and care shown to, the, to open data over the past several years. I'd like to begin by describing the structure of the city's open data program. MODA is the city's hub for advanced data analytics and advocates for the use of open data in citywide projects and in communities. DOIT manages the technical operations of data publishing with, <coughs> with city agencies and our vendor partner, Socrata. Over 90 city agencies have a designated open data coordinator who serves as the primary point of contact with MODA and DOIT and works with their agency's <coughs> data owners to publish eligible data sets. These three entities, along with our partners in City Council and the civic tech community, work together to make city data open and accessible to New Yorkers. <coughs> Since <coughs> the announcement of Open Data for All in July 2015, the administration has been unrelenting in its efforts to put data in the hands of more New Yorkers. We strive to make the open data portal a more user-friendly and accessible tool for anyone interested in using city data. Consider a few highlights since last year's hearing. The open data portal received over 3 million hits in fiscal year 2017 with approximately 140,000 average monthly users. The open data portal now has a new website designed in partnership with the open data community through a human-centered <coughs> design process, as Chair Vaca pointed out, thank you. The Parks <coughs> Resource Centers piloted a data literacy effort to teach New Yorkers how to analyze and map the city's street 
tree census data. We celebrated the five-year anniversary of the original pioneering NYC open data law in March with the city's first open data week produced collaboratively with the civic, civic tech community. In partnership with the city's Commission on Human Rights, MOTA used several data sets from the open data portal to optimize where inspectors search for landlords who are illegally discriminating against potential tenants. In addition, dozens of agencies continue to release high value data sets, bringing the total number of data sets on the open data portal to more than 1,700. We published EMS incident dispatch numbers from the fire department and detailed NYPD complaint data. We also published the city council's data set on participatory budgeting, which is an open community decision making process that allows constituents to choose how to spend public dollars. Each record in this data set represents a project a New Yorker nominated and got funded through the PB process. The data set includes a plain language data dictionary and is easily mapped against other data sets through its standardized geospatial coordinates and political districts fully complying with the 2015 amendments to the open data law. MOTA is currently partnering with PBNYC to give this year's cohort of participants educational resources on NYC open data, helping them <coughs> to better understand how data sets from, for example, NYCHA, NYPD, Department of Education, and other agencies can give context and add specificity to their proposals. We highlighted this and other examples <coughs> of the full open data impact cycle in the 2017 Open Data for All report, which MOTA and DOIT submitted to City Council and the public in July. Readers were also invited to submit their feedback on a digital open source version of the report, which received more than 12,000 hits in the two months since it went live. The highlight <coughs> of the report was the stories of the land use advocates, local startups, community boards, CUNY students and interfaith organizers, New Yorkers from all five boroughs, who are using open data to improve their communities. Our approach to the report reflects our belief that showing the faces behind <coughs> city data is how we spur even greater use. The report highlights green infrastructure researchers who use their analysis of open data <coughs> to start a conversation with the New York City uh, Parks <coughs> and the Department of Environmental Protection about how a new model could improve stormwater collection in the city. It describes an automated dashboard of neighborhood indicators used by community partners to combat joblessness in Brownsville, Brooklyn. These stories and others in the report make up just a handful of the 140,000 New Yorkers who visit <coughs> the open data portal each month, about 60,000 of whom are new to the platform. In order to ensure we are not only increasing the number of users, but also optimizing their experience, we have undertaken significant efforts in the past year to better understand their needs. When results from a graduate capstone MOTA facilitated with Columbia researchers indicated that new users didn't always know how to get started with, the open data, with, with open data, MOTA and DOIT worked with high frequency community users to design for their needs. This resulted in a new look for the open data portal for the, for the open data portal this spring, as well as a new customer service application that allows the team to better respond to users' requests while collecting <coughs> for help and, and co collect data on inquiry types, a new process that is resulting in continuous improvement to the open data platform. The existing open data law requires that data from all agencies, not only select high performers, be published in a way that is accessible, understandable, and usable for everyone. Ensuring the city's compliance <coughs> with the open data laws and policies is the foundation of strong and just open data for all. For this reason, we support <coughs> the goals of introductions 1707 and 1528. In particular, the extension of the open data mandate will allow our program to accommodate new data sets that are created by city agencies. In this year's open data compliance plan, for example, city agencies identified over 100 new data sets that had not previously been disclosed. This was not due to any dis delinquency on the part of the agency's open data coordinator, but because new data systems are constantly coming online and data that may not have been previously qualified as a public data set is now eligible for publication. Extending the legal mandate to publish data sets past December 2018 is a key priority for the administration. 
formalizing the role of open data coordinators and disclosing the names of data sets used to respond to FOIL requests will further enhance our goal of forming communities of practice around open data city agencies. For example, while the, the Office of the Mayor had previously been serviced by a single open data coordinator, MOTA worked with the Mayor's Office of Operations this spring to recruit open data coordinators for all 40 of the smaller offices that make up the Office of the Mayor. Additionally, this year, the open data team required that open data coordinators work directly with their agency records officers and <coughs> general counsels to assemble their data set inventories and compliance reports. We found this to be an effective way to ensure that data publishers were interacting with their legal counsel, and as a result, we received a 100% reporting rate from eligible city agencies. From street furniture to road quality, and from taxi trips to parking meters to small businesses, New Yorkers interact with their city government every day. Because we have a good open data law, this information is available for free online. The extension of the law will allow us to continue to ensure that as the city becomes more data driven, it also becomes more open and transparent. We are excited to continue to partner with the City Council to extend the law and optimize technical standards to allow open data to continue to thrive through changing technological environments. I would like to thank the Committee on Technology for the opportunity to testify today and for its ongoing support of open data. I'd also like to thank Beta NYC, Bureau Blank, Cardo, and Reboot, and all of our many community collaborators whose support makes this work possible. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Albert Weber, who will discuss the administration's perspective on the proposed legislation in more detail. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, Chair Vodka and members of the City Council Committee on Technology. My name is Albert Weber, and I am the Director of Open Data for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. On behalf of the administration, I'd like to extend gratitude to this committee, under the leadership of Chair Vodka, for the attention and care shown to open data over the past several years and for the opportunity to testify today. We all share a steadfast commitment to open data as an instrument of transparency and a bridge to connect New Yorkers with their city. This is why DOIT works closely with MOTA to make open data as accessible as possible. This year's annual open data report was issued on July 14, 2017 and details some of the extraordinary steps we've taken to connect New Yorkers with the data we publish and support them as they use it to tackle issues in their neighborhoods. In fact, one of our important user groups is the City Council, which is why we've collaborated with you to offer several open data trainings for council members and their staff over the next few weeks. I'm happy to report that these sustained efforts have yielded real results. As you heard, we are expecting unprecedented engagement with our data sets, which now number over 1,700, including 170 added in the last year. We have also worked with agencies to automate 38 data sets, ensuring that they are as up-to-date as possible, with some automatically updating as frequently as every five minutes, such as DOT's real-time traffic data set. The open data team continues to make great progress every year, but the expiration of the open data law, Local Law 11 of 2012, at the end of next year gives us all the opportunity to codify some helpful technical changes. Introduction 1707 addresses many of these useful fixes as a result of a productive and collaborative effort between Chair Vaca, Borough President Brewer, Beta NYC, Reinvent Albany, Moda, and Do It. The proposed bill would, one, codify a biannual review of the Technical Standards Manual, also known as the TSM. The TSM is the guiding document on how agencies manage and present their data. These standards are designed to make open data more usable to the maximum number of users. We see the TSM as a living document meant to keep up with the advances in technology, data availability, and the passage of local laws that impact data disclosure. An official periodic review of this document would ensure that open data disclosure stays up to date, relevant, and true to the most current practices. Second, extend the open data law another three years. Current law requires agencies to publish and prioritize for release their data sets by December 31, 2018. We want to ensure that agencies continue to schedule new releases beyond that date. While simply extending the sunset is helpful, we would like to discuss how to improve the language to ensure that submissions meant to be disclosed by December 31, 2018 will still be held to that deadline. Third, change the deadline for the annual compliance plan from July to September. The open data team has learned a lot about the process of collecting information from open data coordinators as July 15 deadline approaches. 
We have found that this timing bumps up against budget season and requests that it be changed to provide sufficient time in each new fiscal year to gather and report information. Additionally, the annual Mayor's Management Report, MMR, is published in September. Shifting the deadline to September will allow us to align these two reporting exercises and efficiently deliver a unified report representing our progress. Fourth, codify the requirement for each agency to designate an open data coordinator. While open data coordinators are currently required under the technical standards manual, codifying this requirement would underscore agencies' commitment to open data in perpetuity. Fifth, require web portal site analytics in perpetuity. Since we already publish web analytics, we support the idea of ensuring that future, future administrations do the same. In addition to these improvements, we suggest amending the license provision of Local Law 11 of 2012 to best serve the goals of open data for all. Currently, Section 23-502 states that all public data sets on the portal should be made available without any license requirement or restriction on their use other than attribution and description of the modifications made to the data set. We have interpreted this to mean that DOIT cannot make the data available under any license, including permissive licenses. However, our mission to encourage public engagement with open data in the long term makes the ability to license very important. Structured properly, licenses could allow us to formally make the city's data sets free and open for public use in perpetuity, codifying our existing practice and ensuring that New Yorkers have access to open data for the long haul. We look forward to a productive dialogue about this provision. Introduction 1528 would amend Local Law 7 of 2016, which currently requires agencies to review Freedom of Information Law FOIL requests containing data to determine whether they contained new public data sets that could be published on open data. Local Law 7 requires agencies to disclose metrics on FOIL responses. Introduction 1528 would require agencies to take the extra step in naming the data sets relating to FOIL responses. This legislation furthers the administration's transparency objectives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Open data remains a priority of this administration, shining a bright light on our government and our city for all New Yorkers to see, and providing the tools to solve thorny civic problems in creative ways. We thank our partners in the city council and in the civic technology community for their continued advocacy. This concludes our prepared testimony, and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome uh, Council Member David Greenfield, who has just joined us. Uh, thank you for the work that you've done and your agency has done. Um, we do think that open data, it, open data is a transparency tool that's fantastic, and we want it used more. We want to urge people to use it on an increased basis. Um, let me ask you some questions. Um, what kinds of uh, reasons prevent the data sets from being automated? Is this because of pushback from agencies, or this is just a techno technological limitation? It depends. So um, it depends on the frequency of update. So there's a lot of work that goes into setting up that automated feed that you know delivers data automatically from the agency's database or from wherever they have it stored to the open data portal. So um, we believe that data should be, if it's updated monthly or more frequently, those are things that we'd like to prioritize for automation. Um, so if you have something that's updated, say, for instance, on an annual basis, the work that goes into setting up that automation doesn't always make sense um, to deliver uh, that data automatically. What ends up happening in some cases that we found out early, and this is something that we've, we've tested, we'll have a data set that's automated once a year. Over the course of 365 days, there's a chance that, you know, uh, something could come in the way, and the work that goes to setting that up is not worth it. It's easier to just take a data set, email it, have us load it, as opposed to going through a, a significant process just to set up that automation. Oh, I do see the 38 data sets were automated this past year, so how does your team decide which to automate? Um, it's a combination between us and from agencies. Um, any agency that wants to automate data, we'll automate it. Um, we take into consideration public feedback heavily. So um, if there are certain data sets that we know are getting heavy usage um, or if we're getting a lot of requests for them, we'll prioritize those for automation. Um, we'll automate anything that agencies are willing and able to automate with us. Well, you did mention public feedback, and I wanted to know how often the comments on the data sets are checked. How often do you look at the uh, comments that the public makes concerning the portal? 
Yeah, we're looking at them every day. Um, so this past March, when we updated the open data portal, one of the things that we did was um, Im implement a new tool that takes in public feedback. Um, one thing that, that wasn't as available on the site prior to the change was a direct way to make feedback for specific use cases. Um, so now you can make comments on public requests, data questions, data errors. Um, we found that there were a lot of questions that came in for the Taxi and Limousine Commission, so we make it apparently obvious that if you want to make a request for a certain thing, it's there. Um, the team is monitoring these daily, and um, there are five or six people monitoring that every day. How many comments do you get on a typical week? It varies. Um, we, I could probably get back to you on those stats. We have it broken down into different categories, and they're monitored by different groups. Um, I, I'd, I'd want to say roughly 30 to 40 a week, but it's hard to say. I could get back to you with those numbers. Okay. Let me ask you, um, when you deal with agencies concerning open data, what's a typical issue that they raise? What are, are there agency concerns that we should know about that you typically get when you talk to them and try to make sure the law is implemented uh, in its full, you know? At, at this point, the engagement is pretty smooth. Um, the law was passed in 2012, but we've been doing open data since 2009, and some agencies had their own sites up prior to that. So at this point, um, it, it's, it's fairly smooth um, of an engagement. Um, we try to provide as much guidance as possible for agencies in terms of the data that they should be releasing. Um, they're looking at public feedback. Um, they're looking at their websites. So we're, we're, it's pretty smooth in engagement at this point. But we did a review of the open data plan for the past four years, and it shows that some agencies are not reporting properly. Who is overseeing agencies to ensure that they are in compliance? Do it and MOTA both provide guidance to agencies um, to work with them to work towards compliance. Have you found resistance, or is there an issue with this? Are people, are the agencies? We haven't run into resistance. I think we have the right open data coordinators in place. Um, the right people in every agency that are making the right decisions are talking to the right people. So we have not met resistance. Well, I realize when you deal with agencies, we're talking big, small, medium-sized commissions and the gambit. But we did look into the Civil Service Commission, for example. So the Civil Service Commission updated the plan with their appeals data every year since 2013 except for 2016. The 2016 data was neither included in the portal and the rem nor was the removal of the data recorded in the 2016 data report. So how will MOTO ensure that these plans are being reviewed for accuracy year to year? We can look into this particular instance. Um, every year in the plan, what we include is an agency comment with the scheduled releases. So if a data is changed, if a data set is, if a change in priority was made, um, we'll include that comment in the plan. And the same thing with removals. If a data set's removed from the plan, we'll include the reason why. Um, if that was removed, that, that would have been a mistake, and we'll definitely look into that. So I want to make sure that we guarantee that even the smallest of agencies are complying with the law. I know that there are personnel issues possibly in the smaller issues, but that can't be a subterfuge mm -hmm. in, in, in my view. Now, Noda, Moda indicated that they were working on a survey at the last data hearing we held uh, so that all agencies can submit their public data to the portal more, more systematically. Has the administration taken other steps to ensure that agencies are in compliance? Well, I would say this is a part of the reason that we greatly expanded the number of open data coordinators, um, including all the smaller offices of the mayor of having their specific data coordinators. I wanted to get to this now. In this year's open data report, I was very happy to see that MODA will be releasing an online project library and documentation of its open source analytics framework. As you know, I'm very concerned with how city agencies develop algorithms, and this is an important step in the process. Do you feel this type of documentation is something that could and should be encoded into law? Well, I, I think we're looking forward to a hearing on that topic. I know. Correct? <laughs> I, would, I would have to defer to that uh, to speak at, the, at that time. Um, but of course, MOTA does 
believe that documentation is, is very important and communication is an important piece of analytics. Okay. My concern is transparency so that people can understand how agencies arrive at the decision they arrive at. And that's where, al that's where algorithms come in. And I do know we're having a future hearing on my bill next month, but as, as a preview, it's kind of inconsistent that we go with an open data outreach and open data engagement, and then people are still left in the dark when it comes to other parts of government decision making. So I'd like you to look at your open data report and then get back to us because I think that that report sets a framework for us to have those serious discussions we should have on algorithms. So we have to be consistent and that's why I brought that up. I know I can expect support because um, people are entitled to that information. You know, I come back to the same old story. So I, I have uh, I have many youngsters in my uh, district and they apply for a high school and then they're rejected. They get their seventh choice and they're told that the school you wanted has no room. That's the explanation. They don't know what went into that decision. What information was fed into a computer that didn't give this kid his first, second or third choice but gave somebody else their first, second or third choice. It's basic transparency that parents are entitled to, which they don't get right now. Okay, we'll go back, but I wanted to cite that. Now, um, are there any staffing budget needs that are unmet by your agency that you feel should be addressed by the council or the administration? I know that we're doing a lot of work here, but uh, do you feel that the staffing is adequate based on the uh, outreach and the uh, administrative work that's involved? Uh, at this time, I, I think we're meeting our operational requirements with uh, existing staffing. Okay. This year, the Open Data Help Desk feature was added to the website, and there was a large increase in the number of inquiries made. Are the complaints made through the Help Desk available for the public to review? Will they know if a complaint they made has been raised and addressed? How can we track that, track a complaint? So of the feedback that comes in, we're currently making the public data set requests available, and we also have an alerts feature. Um, so when a complaint or a data error comes in that is extremely of note, we'll make that available. So if for some reason a data set, um, if the automation went down and it's down for a period of time longer than we'd like, we'll make those alerts available. Okay, I have no further questions. No? Oh, yeah, about the legislation. I forgot. <laughs> so, sometimes. So, you seem to be in favor of, uh, you have no problems with my bill, as is, the bill I introduced. You, your testimony indicates that as is 17, or what? 07, I forget the numbers. 1707, you have no problems with. We support the goal of the legislation. No, 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 no. Don't start with that. <laughs> Don't start with that with me. You said you had, you support the goal. I mean, we all support the goal of winning the lottery. It doesn't mean we win. <laughs> do, you, do you support the legislation? I got the impression. Should I be reading between the lines? Are, are, are you in politics that I have to read these things so carefully? Because <laughs> politicians, you always, you know, they never say what you think they said. But l let me ask you. Um, where are you on that? We largely support the legislation. Okay. Do, do you have any amendments that you would like or anything that concerns you? Because that's what the hearing is about also, the ledge. We mentioned the piece in terms of um, the licensing provision on the open data law. We, d we do feel that um, changes to that legislation where we could potentially uh, include license provisioning on the open data portal would be helpful. Um, the way it's currently interpreted by us is there's no license that could be put on a data set, and that would be very helpful. Okay. Now, since introducing the legislation, we've heard from advocates that the extension of the deadline to 2021 might have negative implications and that agencies will potentially lack the impetus to publish data sets sooner. Do you have that, do you have that concern? No, not, no. Um, 
I think looking at putting always putting a deadline, I think is always helpful. Um, but no, we do not have concerns that pushing it to 2021 will delay the release of some data sets. And, and we also would like to look at uh, looking at the legislation or looking at the terms of the legislation to make sure any data that's listed between now and 2018 is still held to that deadline. Okay, that's important. To us as well. Now on 1528, uh, the, you know that uh, there were 5,004 responses that included public data sets not included on the open data portal this past year. Will there be any technical issues with releasing the names of these data sets? We don't believe there will be. Now, concerning Council Member Brewer's bill, you, you had some requests to, I, I think you did say you were for that in, in principle, but you had some issues there. Okay. At 1707. Um, One was the FOIL bill that was mine, and the other bill was Council Member Brewer's bill. I'm also on that, I know, but it's, it's her main bill. Right. If, if you could, which, which? What, what was the number? How is it 1707? You said here that um, you would codify a biannual review, so. Yeah, that, that was in regards to the licensing provision. That's the licensing provision. Yeah. I go on to then, all right, now regarding 1528, you had no problem with that bill. I want to clarify where you are on both pieces. Oh, no, no, we, we, we largely support it. Yeah, because when you spoke about licensing requirement, yeah. I, I didn't get it for a minute because my bill does not have that issue. So you, my bill is, is 1528, and then my bill with Gail Brewer, you have some issues with. So in you terms have some of concerns regarding licensing. Yes, yeah, so the only thing with the licensing is that we'd like to see some language that would allow licensing. Um, the way it's being interpreted is that um, we can't even have uh, permissive licenses on the data. So if there could be some changes where we could do that, that would be extremely helpful. Okay, I got it. Okay, there being no questions from the council, I will thank you so much for coming attending the meeting, and thank you for your help. As I did say, this is our last hearing of this committee, and uh, I hope the next committee grill, grills you like I have, so <laughs> let's put it that way. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. your work. Is Gail here? Oh, Gail is here, okay. Borough President, I, I was gonna say council member, but I did, right? Council member, Gail, former council member, Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough President is a prime sponsor of one of the bills today and she her work her work as a pioneer of open data is well known to all so we welcome you as always thank you very much um, it is an honor to be here I am Gail Brewer I am the Manhattan Borough President and I want to thank Chair Vaca and uh, for all of his support on this topic I want to congratulate him on the New York Times article talking about ag algorithms that was very exciting um, I'm not the expert, there are experts in the room, but I do think that our local law 11 of 2012, the open data law, was a turning point in some of these discussions. And you should know, Mr. Chair, that I just met with a, um, elected officials in Spain, um, Madrid, maybe others have met with them, I know the city did, and they are looking at our law, they passed an ordinance, and we can talk about the reasons we have laws instead of ordinances. Um, but uh, then this gentleman was going to be speaking at the United Nations yesterday about the issue of open data. So it's a very current topic around the world, and I think we should all be proud, not just me, that apparently our law is considered the model for looking at other cities. So congratulations to you for keeping the discussion going, um, and it is always exciting to be with all the civic tech organizations that are here. So no question, and you said this just now, that whoever... Unfortunately, you will not be here but uh, as chair, but the open data law continues to be a major undertaking and questions must continue to be asked. And I want to th thank DoIT and I want to thank the uh, Chief Technology Officer, Miguel Gamino, for all of the efforts and MOTA, people you have mentioned, and they all are helping keeping this law current. Um, it was Mayor Bloomberg who signed the law, uh, the bill into law, and that was, as I said, the first large-scale municipal open data portal. It wasn't a regulation and an ordinance, and I think this, it's an important point to make 
because we know that as uh, just after the inauguration of a certain federal official on January 20th, 2017, the federal government began removing information from its websites that had been published in the name of public access and shared knowledge. There's no federal law to protect public information from an administration that does not believe in facts or transparency. We know that and that's why we have a law. Um, by contrast, we are assembled here today to discuss making our transparency laws stronger and more effective. Thanks to the chair. I certainly support uh, your uh, intro 528, reporting the names of public data sets that are requested under the Freedom of Information Law is within the spirit of FOIL and open data. And I support amending 1528 to allow Dewitt to consider which license would make the city's data sets free and open for public use in perpetuity. I know that we both introduced 1707 to further integrate open data reporting into the workflows and culture of our civil servants while giving advocates of transparency more tools to analyze and respond to the city's open data methodology. 1707 would support the work of the mayor's office with the open data coordinators who guide their agencies towards compliance by making the position a required one for each agency. Along with open data advocates like Rhea Van Albany and Beta NYC, both of whose leaders are here today, thank goodness, the open data coordinators are the unsung heroes who make New York City the leader in open data. That's where we are today. And I want to congratulate to everyone the new requirements in this bill for the collection, analysis, and public reporting of open data portal analytics will support your efforts and strengthen your legacy. All legislation need tweaking to enhance potential, and obviously this bill is no different. I know that the text creates some confusion, and we talked about this earlier, about the 2021 deadline for agency compi compi compliance. I think the language could perhaps be clarified to state the original 2018 compliance deadline is still in effect and that intro 1707 is extending the law itself to 2021. The open data coordinators of each agency are working very hard to meet the 2018 deadline and give New Yorkers a full selection of what the city is able to publish. I would like to see added to the bill uh, a safeguard um, that we have all worked on to build and improve were New Yorkers to one day elect a mayor like the current leader of our federal executive, open data would be endangered. We know now that our democracy is only as strong as the institutions that serve as its pillars and the laws and advocates who support them. I believe you must provide a, right, a private right of action to protect New York City municipal open day app apparatus from a future administration that does not wish to operate it in good faith as the current and previous administrations have done. I talked last year when I talked about our then future plans to work with Noel Hildago, who's here. Uh, he is the director of Beta NYC, and he's been working with us and the CUNY Service Fellows to build new tools, making open data more useful to the unique needs of Manhattan's 12 community boards. And I am really happy to report that the work has been successful uh, Microsoft is working with us to even make the work even more successful and more transparent and more accessible, particularly for the boards. And this Saturday, we are, will be announcing a 311 data visualization tool that was built from the ground up for community boards by, by the A1C, Microsoft, and the students. And we certainly want to thank Mary McCormick, director of the Fund for the City of New York and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for making the program and its success possible with their grants. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today and I look forward because I know there are changes that could easily be made to make these bills even more uh, appropriate for passage. And thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for all of your work. This is actually hard to think that you will not be chairing this committee because you have done a phenomenal job. Thank you and I see my friend, Madam, Council Member Palmer over there. Nice to see you. Thank you, thank you, Gail, and thank you again for being the pioneer and the uh, mover and shaker years ago for all that uh, started out that we've been able to build on. All of us together, thank all you very together. much. Thank you, Gail Bloomer. Okay, we do have a panel.
Mary Tobin, Lexington Avenue, Brooklyn, Brownsville, representing the Brownsville Partnership. John Caney, reinvent Albany, right? Okay, and Noel Hidalgo, Baden, New York City. Please come up. Okay, Mary, I'm gonna call on you first. You introduce yourself for the record and please give your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Vaca and the members of the Technology Committee. My name is Mary Tobin and I have the honor of serving the community of Brownsville, Brooklyn as the director of the Brownsville Partnership, which is an initiative of the nonprofit Community Solutions. At Community Solutions, we work very hard to end homelessness and the conditions of poverty that create it. And at the core of everything we do is data. The Brownsville Partnership strategic plan focuses on engaging residents and partner organizations from many sectors in measurably improving the health, safety, and economic prosperity of Brownsville, which simply means we want to see people find jobs, live in a safer environment, and obtain a higher quality of life. How does data help us do that? Well, we take existing neighborhood data on everything from health to crime to education and unemployment, and we then analyze that data to highlight any inefficiencies, gaps in, in existing systems that serve the neighborhood we work in. We use those insights to direct problem solving efforts where they need to be applied the most. For example, in my very own Brownsville Employment Pathways Initiative, we work on ways to increase the overall number of people from Brownsville who gain employment. Our early analysis of the Brownsville data that we obtained from NYC Open Data reveal that there are three critical cohorts within a general populace of Brownsville who are facing the most difficulty obtaining, in obtaining employment. Given the unique barriers to employment these specific three cohorts face, the Brownsville Partnership strategy has been to more actively engage with the employers who work to employ these cohorts. This very specific strategy has resulted in meaningful conversations, more jobs, and also very, uh, very meaningful um, strategizing sessions with public agencies and other nonprofits around how to improve employment outcomes. This strategy also allows organizations like mine with limited money, people, and time to direct our resources to the areas and the residents who need them the most. We won't stop there, as we are currently in partnership with key organizations using data to improve outcomes for our most vulnerable population, children ages th zero to three. Because of the foresight of the leaders in this room and the work of the NYC Open Data Team, organizations like mine are able to begin to pinpoint the most critical issues in neighborhoods like Brownsville. As we work together with the residents and community-based organizations to pool our own resources, test our own strategies, and solve our own problems. We truly do believe that we can begin to move the needle on poverty but we aren't there yet, which is why continuing to leverage programs like these is critical to our work. For the work that my team does every day in a neighborhood that I've come to love as my own, data is not just spreadsheets and charts. It represents a life that deserves the opportunity to thrive in conditions that other Americans enjoy every single day. Thank you for your time and consideration. Hope is truly inside of Brownsville. I am very moved by your testimony. I think it's fantastic. This Thank is you, exactly what we fight for. We fight, to, we, we fight for neighborhoods to use open data to empower them. And you have used it and you have been empowered. And I wanna thank you and your organization. But uh, I wish more people did that. Uh, I do think we still have a, an education component and right. an engagement component that has to be uh, really improved. But uh, the fact that you're there and that you have that enthusiasm, but that you're using the technology and what we have fought so hard for at the council to make available to you right. is, is rewarding to me, so. Absolutely, thank you, thank you're, you all. You're great, thank you for being thank here. You. Thank you. Mr. Keeney? Thanks, um, thanks Mary. I haven't <laughs> met you before, but that was great and I feel like I can leave now because um, this is really what we've been fighting for for Absolutely. a long time now, thank so you. thank you, it's very inspiring. And um, as, as thanks go, um, you know, this is uh, a really big day for us uh, to, to thank you, Mr. Chair, Jimmy Baca. Um, you know, when Mike Bloomberg left as mayor and Mayor de Blasio took over, no one was sure where uh, open data would go, but um, you've, you've kept it going and pushed it ahead through 
you know, highs and lows, and we really, really appreciate um, your tenacity and your intelligence and your forcefulness and um, just uh, making this a priority, and it's, a, it's incredibly gratifying, so thank you. Um, and from everyone at the New York City Transparency Working Group, all the good government groups that um, comprise our coalition, you know, thanks for your effort and for um, keeping it going there. And um, it really matters. And, you know, uh, I don't know who we're going to get as next chair that can uh, step into your shoes, but, you know, uh, for now, thanks. So um, uh, the, I have some comments um, that are both going to speak to the bills and to general oversight. And uh, your staff asked us to please not forget oversight, so we will um, talk a little bit about oversight. Um, generally, just the state of open data to us seems pretty good in New York City, in part because of you and you and people we haven't met who are using the open data and because we have a public culture uh, within civil society here, within journalism, uh, within uh, elected politics, uh, community boards, community-based organizations of using open data and an expectation that public data will be available in a usable form by the public. And that expectation is the most important legacy of the law and of your persistent oversight. So that's, that's good news. And the other good news is that we have the funding for the city's open data team who we think are great and, um, and appreciate their work. And we don't take it for granted that um, we'll always have that funding available. Uh, so I'm very pleased that you asked the question about do you have the resources you need? And I hope council continues to fund uh, the open data team uh, going forward because without people uh, keeping it going, the technology will fall apart very, very quickly. So um, we're not forgetting that. And I also wanted to touch on um, how important automation is, and thank you for your questions about automating data sets. We think in terms of sustaining open data, uh, as well as a public culture and a culture of oversight, it's the automation of those data sets and the most used data sets that is going to keep this thing going um, when other things are not going so well administratively in New York City. So. I um, wanted to thank um, Albert, who's not here, and um, his team and the other folks uh, at uh, the Open Data team for their automation efforts, which we think is extremely, extremely important. So thank you for your, your asking questions about that. Um, I don't know if folks here saw yesterday um, 538.com, which is a big um, uh, blog that does statistical analysis and um, they did a big story using New York City 311 data and they shouted out to the open data portal and they did a visualization of 311 calls about Hurricane Sandy and the legacy of Hurricane Sandy but everyone should take a look at it and I thought it was an interesting example of how open data and New York City's open data law is changing culture and perspectives and just you know uh, leaking into all all kinds of different areas um, some specific oversight issues uh, last year the, uh, and the year before that, the council passed seven open data law amendments and they included new mandates for standardizing addresses and including data dictionaries and basically making the data more usable. Um, we, we loved the amendments. We thought they were great and really helpful. The, um, but one of the things that the uh, amendments highlighted was the fact that it is really, really hard to keep track um, of what's happening with open data sets uh, for the public. When they're published, um, whether they're meeting the open, uh, uh, the amendments or not, and just the information about generally how well the agencies are complying with the law. So um, I'm glad to hear that uh, Albert Weber at Do It's not having pushback from agencies, but um, what we're seeing is fog when it comes to understanding exactly how well agencies are doing. So of course we can see the data sets on the open data portal, but we're having a lot of trouble reconciling the agency plans, their publishing plans, with what actually makes it all the way to the portal. So um, uh, just a couple of stats that we pulled, um, there for data dictionaries, for instance, the city listed 1,648 data sets. Uh, 615 have, uh, data sets have data dictionaries, which is a lot more than we thought would have, so uh, kudos to the administration. And 1,033 don't. Um, for address standardization, uh, 350 data sets are listed in the city's um, portal, uh, and 206 of those are listed as having uh, standardized addresses. So out of the roughly 1,700 published city data sets, the city is confirming that 206 have standardized uh, addresses right now. Um, 
one of the things I would point to is that there are at least four different spreadsheets scattered around the open data portal for reporting on the status of different data sets. And what we would like to see is one data set that includes all of the city's public data, and I'll get to this in more detail, all of the city's public data and their status, whether it's published or unpublished, when it's going to be scheduled, whether it's been rescheduled, whether it's meeting the, the address standardization mandate, whether it has a data dictionary, all of that stuff in one data set that the public can download and look at that's machine readable and easy to sort so that we can keep track of what's going on. Because right now, um, the information is spread over at least four uh, different sources and it's incomplete. So for instance, data dictionaries, the city lists 1,648 data sets, um, the status of their data dictionaries, but for address and geospatial, they list 350 data sets. Why? We don't know. So um, rather than having separate scattered data sets, we'd rather just see one big one where you can look. Um, publishing and the publishing status of data sets. The core of the open data law in 2012 was to define what a public data set was and then to tell agencies that they had to start a, a, a methodical way of publishing that data for the public. So even now, um, we still have trouble understanding what the status is of planned data, of publishing dates. And um, it's kind of a, a shifting stand for us. So um, we drilled down and we have a spreadsheet that I'll share with you and provide to the administration um, as a spreadsheet. Um, we looked at six data sets um, two street tree data sets from parks, fire departments, fire incident, construction authority funded capacity seats for schools, and HRA's cash assistance engagement data sets. And all those data sets were planned for publication um, and scheduled in 2014. And of those six data sets, four were never published, but there was no update on what happened to those four. Now we picked those six at complete random. I mean, just, you know, throwing darts at the computer screen. and. Um, the, um, so we hope that this is not a, a tip of an iceberg, but it does point to the fact that what goes on and off of the, um, the data of the agency um, publishing plans is, is very hard to track for the public right now. And that's, again, why we just want one website, I mean, pardon me, one data set that just says when, when this thing is going to be published and, you know, if it's rescheduled, when and why, just in one place. So. Um, so that, so, you know, good news overall, good culture, great stuff going on, great team, but um, some murky details here that need to be sorted, and, and I'm going to get to some specific recommendations in a moment. Um, overall, we're really concerned about agency procrastination and the fact that there's so many data sets backloaded to the second half of 2018 for publication. Um, we count 102 data sets uh, to be published in the second half of 2018. 70 of those in December of 2018. So to us, that's like a kid, a high school kid promising to turn in all their homework on the last day of school, and we're having a little trouble, um, you know, buying it right now. So that segues into the, um, into the comments on legislation. Um, the um, 1528 open data FOIL amendment, we strongly, strongly support that. It's a small adjustment that um, helps, um, helps make the, that bill more effective. Um, I mean, pardon me, the existing Local Law 7 of 2016 more effective. Um, for those in the audience who want to know what that secretive thing is, it's, um, it, it just asks agencies to publish the list of um, data sets they're using when they, by name, when they, apply, uh, when they reply to a FOIL request. Um, on, on your bigger bill, your joint bill with the borough president, um, we have some pretty extensive comments that revolve around three areas, and we've already provided you with some written comments, but basically we think the, that this bill should have three goals. One, to clarify that the open data law will continue past 2018 forever in perpetuity. So we want to make sure that there's language in it that makes it absolutely clear that the, do, that, the, that the open data law continues, you know, past 2018 and past 2021. Um, so, um, that's one thing. Secondly, um, we want to see uh, strengthening of the mandate for the agencies to continue to publish public data sets uh, forever. So, um, and I'll get to that. And then lastly, um, we want to see language that encourages and fosters more data set automation. So we think those are the three big goals that should happen. 
Um, specific recommendations, uh, you know, this is complicated, but um, we would like to see you keep the 2018 deadline for publication. We are worried that the agencies are going to feel that they're off the hook, and we're not sure how to make them, you know, stick to their own schedule and publish the 2018 thing. Um, and to that end, uh, you know, we, we think the 2021 extension, though there's a logic to it, um, might un unfortunately um, feel, give the agencies, you know, a homework extension that they'll, they're never going to get to. So um, we think there's a way to, to get around that by keeping the 2018 deadline in place and then creating a new requirement that, that new data sets be published within 12 months or some time frame of when they're identified. So when a new data set is created, um, whatever do it or the administration feels is a reasonable time, that data set should be, if it's public and classified as public, should then be under a publishing deadline. So that's how we think that, that this could work here, um, that we understand what you're getting at. Um, just a couple more uh, things here. Um, Big, big ask here is the creating a new mandate requiring a new status of all public data sets, uh, one big data set on the open data portal. And um, we think that would help greatly, greatly increase transparency, and it would actually help the administration and the council keep track of all the data sets and all of the different mandates by putting them in one place, um, one big long list, and that would be all public data sets, whether they're published or not published, anything identified as a public data set. Um, and then we could look at those and we wouldn't have to go searching around, which is a problem for us. Um, we think that's especially important because there's no public right of action, or pardon me, private right of action, um, that allows the public to sue agencies when they're not complying with the open data law. And so what you do and what we do is name and shame the laggard agencies and we're having trouble understanding which agencies are laggard right now because of, of the, the difficulty in tracking the different data sets, at least from the public side. Um, therefore, we're, we're hopeful that you might add bill language to this um, bigger bill, creating this single, what we're calling status of all public data sets, um, which we think that would not be a burden at all on the administration and in fact would help them and is something that we would think that they would want. Um, the, um, we have a list of the specific elements that we think that all the data sets should have as a starter, you know, scheduled publication, current scheduled publication, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's fairly apparent what we're asking for. Um, we would like to see another provision added to this bill uh, on automating data sets, and that would require reporting fields in this status of all data sets, data set, that say um, whether a data set is automated whether it can be automated, um, and then establishing a, um, a schedule for automation of sorts. So uh, Albert Weber said that 30 days or uh, update, uh, data sets that update every month are reasonable targets for automation. Sounds reasonable to us. But we would like to see data automation codified and maybe formalized a little bit. We think it's a little loosey-goosey right now, and um, that it's because it is so important this needs to be tracked, and in particular, the next chair who is not going to be as knowledgeable as you about this is going to need to have that kind of very clear reporting metrics. So that would be another. Um, and then additionally, why a data set cannot be uh, automated. So to summary, summarize the, our uh, take on the provisions in 1707, um, we strongly support the review of the technical standards manual every two years. Um, we support changing the compliance plan deadline from July to September. That's totally reasonable. Um, we support designated agency open data coordinators under the law instead of voluntarily. And um, we support publishing website portal analytics. But we would ask that you um, consider uh, not extending the publishing deadline to 2021, but keep the 2018 deadline in place with, with additional language that clarifies that the open data law will continue in perpetuity and then establish a mandate for, for publishing new data sets that come after that time. And then lastly, um, uh, like uh, Borough President Brewer, um, we strongly support a private right of action 
um, for the public to be able to sue agencies who are not complying with the open data law. And we would note that there's only a, a handful of New York City laws, a very tiny, tiny minority um, that don't have a private right of action and that the open data law is actually very unusual in that regard. So uh, thank you for the extra time and uh, much appreciate it. Oh, I should add that we support uh, do its proposal to add uh, licensing language about permissive licensing language, which we think is common sense, too. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your work. It's fantastic to know that people like you will be continuing this work, and uh, your, your, your advocacy is very important to us. Thank you. Thank you. Noel? Hello. Um, I want to echo everybody else's comments in regards to thanking you personally as well as um, Borough President Brewer for your steadfast leadership in open data and open government in here in New York City. Um, it's been refreshing to go from one leadership to another leadership and to be able to have that continuation. So thank you both for all of that work. Um, I'd also want to point out that you know we're here because of many elders, um, Beta NYC, particularly uh, from Gizmo to the Fund for the City of New York to NYPIRT to Transportation Alternatives, who um, have been embracing this data transparency movement for a while um, and just wanted to give them a shout out and a thanks um, because the elders of our community have been coming in and providing us the type of feedback to help grow uh, tools like BoardStat that, um, uh, that Gail mentioned. Um, and that the statement once again that Gail mentioned um, around the world seeing New York City as an open data leader um, in all of my travels that I've had the um, that I've been fortunate to experience um, it, time and time again it's how do you how did you get the open data law passed how do you continue to have such a robust program how do you modernize uh, um, your open data system so that way you continue to stay at the forefront and you know, across the United Nation, uh, across the U United States, I um, I get asked that question. Uh, this past week, I had a chance to meet with somebody from um, Valencia, Spain, and they were asking why, how how can New York City be so far ahead? Um, and here is a great opportunity uh, uh, at this particular time to think about how we can stay ahead. So some of the community things that that do it mentioned beforehand. Um, the celebration of the fifth anniversary of the Open Data Law, the, we inaugur the inauguration of Open Data Week, and the celebration of International Open Data Day um, converged uh, uh, this past year. And we had over 350 people in attendance. And this is the second year that we've hosted NYC School of Data. And we think we fi have finally ironed out a platform that enables government and community to share their stories back and forth and to uh, uh, empower each other. Uh, we've been able to, in, in this process, include a number of curriculum items that we're uh, hoping to seed and experiment and then be able to share through permissive licensing back to the city so the city has a foundation as well as community-based organizations have a foundation to further educate their different communities. Um, in regards to something that we've experimented with with the Parks Department uh, and city planning this year, and we're going to continue uh, this weekend with 311, is we've started these things called data jams, which uh, enable, once again, the city uh, government agencies and, and partners, private partners, to come in and to explore uh, uh, algorithms, to explore data sets, kind of data schemas. Um, and this has been a, um, a great opportunity for us to develop a model and a replicable model that well, we're happy to engage with the city to hopefully continue. And we wouldn't be able to do uh, NYC School of Data or Data Jams if it wasn't for the robust open data program that we have now. And, to, and really those programs, those civic engagement programs are a testament to the mayoral leadership and, and the agencies adopting open data programs and being open and transparent about the, the fact that they want to explore and build a, a data-driven uh, decision-making programs. So I wanted to commend uh, those different agencies that have been participating with us. Um, in regards to the Civic Innovation Fellows, a program that we uh, have partnered with 
uh, Manhattan Borough President for the last few years. We've been able to expose 25 undergraduate students um, to the city's municipal infrastructure and educate them on the value of open data. And in the past two years, we've been able to move beyond open data and we've been able to map out uh, community board district office technical needs. This is something that we brought up a few times in some oversight hearing um, and, uh, and that we're in the process of building board stat which is a tool that will simplify community board access to 311 service request data. Um, and we're gonna be launching it this weekend. Uh, what this tool has exposed is a continued need for vigilance around data quality. Um, there's some issues in regards to 311, um, uh, the 311 geocoder. Um, and when you were asking your question about where could resources be uh, um, placed, uh, we really see that there's a huge opportunity. I didn't write this in here, but there's a huge opportunity to improve um, geo support, which is a, a tool that so many agencies use to translate BIN, BBLs, lat longs, uh, addresses in general without having to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to a private uh, provider. Um, and what we've discovered is that if you are uh, making a mobile phone 311 service request and you are in uh, Marble Hill, it will geocode your service request as Community Board 8 Manhattan, even though you are in Manhattan, but you happen to be attached to the Bronx and your community board is CB8 in the Bronx. Um, and there's a, a few other data anomalies that we've uh, discovered and we wish that GeoSupport would have the um, investment uh, to bring it up to a, the 21st century um, and hopefully be an open source stack that we can, the community can help improve GeoSupport. Um, Let's see where to keep on going. Um, okay, to the legislation at hand. Um, uh, so, hmm, okay, hold on. I didn't, um, I'm trying to sh summarize all of this very quickly. Um, five years into the open data program, we still see uh, quite a bit of inequality. Um, uh, I can point to I, I hate to use the Department of Transportation as a punching bag, um, but the the two best examples that I have in regards to the legislation that you introduce um, actually affect the Department of Transportation. Um, and so one of them is the East River uh, bicycle counts. So every time a cyclist goes over one of the East River bridges, there's a little device that tracks uh, and monitors uh, um, the bicycle going over it. Um, and if I go to the Department of Transportation's website, I can't get access to that data. I only get a PDF. And when I actually click onto where I can get access to the data on the city's open data portal, I get an Excel spreadsheet that's been highly formatted on annual basis and doesn't conform to the technical standards manual. And um, it's frustrating because I know that this data set is automated. I know that the DOT is getting that data in an automated basis. There is very little concern in regards to privacy violations with that particular data. And so that data set should be something that should be up on the data portal, it should be automated, and, and it should be in access on a, on a daily basis. Uh, cities like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, they have gamified kind of bicycle uh, um, uh, uh, cycling throughout the city where there's little bollards that say how many people have gone through this particular uh, intersection. And if you look at some reporting on Streets blog, it actually increases cycling activity. Um, and it's just one example of how we could turn the city's open data into a more actionable uh, um, environment. Um, and it's definitely something that we hope that the modification to the open data law uh, around the technical standards manual would push the Department of Transportation to make this data um, machine readable um, in a more real-time way. Um, the next um, example from the DOT is around street closures and I know that you as the chair of the Transportation Committee um, had to deal with some of these issues but um, as, a, as again, as a cyclist, I found myself this year um, going down Driggs Avenue and then all of a sudden coming across the DOT maintenance team ripping apart the bicycle lane that was there and there was no warning. Um, and for years, for years and years and years, I've used the example of uh, 
street milling data as an excellent example of if we could get this machine readable, we could be able to build an application off of it. And just this spring, I was complaining about the fact that uh, bicycle lanes seem to vanish uh, out from underneath me, and then I'll, all of a sudden I have to wait six uh, weeks, if not two months, to find out when this bicycle lane would be replaced. And sure enough, uh, that happened again this year uh, as I was cycling down Driggs. Uh, and then as I was preparing my written notes, I come to find out that DOT, since the spring, has been putting that data on the open data portal. And to echo John's uh, comments, you know, it's very hard for us to track what data gets up on the data portal when um, we commend MoDA and do its uh, uh, activities to get the data up on the data portal, we wish that there was um, one canonical location where we could see how data activity is, is being produced on the city's open data portal. Um, and we would love for uh, data sets like this um, um, to be within the geospatial open data standards. Um, and we want this data set to comply with that law. And sadly, it's been automated. It's been, it updates every single day, but it isn't complied, uh, it isn't in line with local law 108 of 2015, the geos, um, uh, geospatial data standards. Um, so I think that that kind of addresses some of the other points. The one concern that we have in regards to the legislation um, is around the web portal analytics. The language right now, as it has been introduced, says um, uh, that something around people's uh, location um, and that the reports should be around people's location. Um, and we think that that vague language could be strengthened to ensure and protect people's privacy, um, which uh, right now you can interpret it that uh, everybody who visits the website, you can more or less report on their IP address. Um, and you could identify like where exactly people are coming from. Um, and maybe we can work on some type of uh, terminology that puts enough uh, of a clarification to protect people's privacy, um, uh, particularly individual and location privacy. Uh, and the last thing is we want to echo uh, the private right of action, uh, as so many others have, uh, have stated. We really think that that would cement the, an open data legacy um, uh, for those of you who have been working really, really hard at this. Uh, we think that it would also provide the sustainable framework for uh, future activity. Um, and lead, uh, make New York City an open data leader, uh, continue to make New York City open data leader in the world. I think that's it. Wow. You gave us a lot of things to chew on, I guess. And uh, all your testimony was very technical and really helpful. And uh, we will take it back as we work on the bill with the Borough President Brewer and myself. And we want to come up with the uh, perfect product, of course. Whenever you do legislation, you want the perfect product, but we want to have all the stakeholders like yourself at the table, and we thank you so much for coming. I want to thank Councilmember Palmer, who stayed for the entire hearing tonight, which is fantastic. Thank you. There being no further testimony, I thank this, I thank, oh, do we have one more test? Oh, one more person? Oh, do we have a slide? Are you filling it out now? Okay. We have one more person. Sumana. Hello. My name is Sumana Harihadeshwara, and I don't blame you for not being able to pronounce that from my messy okay. handwriting. Thank you. Sure. You're from, you're from Astoria, Queens? It, yes, I live okay. in Astoria. Um, so I am not here representing anyone in particular. Um, I uh, very much appreciate the tweet that you sent out asking members of the public to come give their feedback on the laws that you were considering today. Um, I am an open source software expert and a programmer and uh, someone who's a New Yorker who is 
very much in favor of the open data work that's been happening here over the past few years. So I'm very grateful for both the bills that are being discussed today to improve and expand it and make it more sustainable for city agencies. So I have three concerns, all of which have been brought up by other people here, so I'm just gonna second all of them just so you know that there's at least one more person here who's also a programmer who thinks all these are great ideas. Um, one is clarifying that there is still a 2018 deadline, so just as the Transparency Committee representative mentioned, so that we don't have the issue of these, uh, this bit of work being put off over and over again. Um, I very much agree with Mr. Weber about licensing. I can say as someone who programs, looks for open data, and tries to find openly licensed data so that I know when I remix it, when I write presentations based on it, when I add it to applications that I'm making, I want to absolutely make sure that I'm in the clear legally on the data that I'm using. And using commonly agreed upon licenses that are uh, attribution or that are in keeping with the open definition are a way that I can feel quickly that yes this sort of has the brand name of openness stamped upon it and so I would very much agree with Mr. Weber that having a provision in here that says that licenses that are in accord with the open definition would be fine that, that would be really great. Third, I want to agree with Mr. Hidalgo and what he just said about the website portal analytics section of this. And that's actually specifically what I came here to discuss. In the section of uh, 1707 that adds information, that adds a provision about website portal analytics, the language here is actually a little worrying from a privacy standpoint. As Mr. Hidalgo mentioned, the location from which a user accesses such portal is vague enough that it could be interpreted to say all the way down to their, their individual IP address, which in many cases basically translates as a street address, as a person's actual address where they live. IP addresses in the internet security community are commonly understood now to be practically PII, pri personally identifying information to such an extent that they should be uh, treated with uh, due respect and, and confidentiality and uh, got, gotten rid of as soon as possible under certain retention policies. So clarifying that and also uh, uh, clarifying that would be great. Num I think that it might be a good idea to clarify this provision so that instead of page views, unique users, and the location from which a user accesses such a portal, specifying a little bit more about the parameters that we're actually looking for would be good. Location, do we care more about simply within or outside of New York City? Or do we care about location down to the borough level or the community board level or, or something like that? Because that's the kind of data that potentially would be actionable by public data advocates, agencies, and so on as they manage and, and incentivize particular kinds of work without posing a privacy risk to people who are looking up open data about sensitive topics. Page views, great. Numbers of page views, great. Unique users, I don't want to be identified uniquely in a public place for having looked up a certain piece of, uh, of data. So number of unique users, perhaps, is what this ought to say. So I wanted to mention these as concerns that I and a number of other privacy advocates as well would have about this bill. I very much appreciate your testimony. And uh, I share some of your concerns. And, and we're going to take a look at it. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I'm glad that the tweet, <laughs> I'm glad somebody reads my tweets. I tweet. I so I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more specifically. Most times I see one person, two people. I figured it's a relative of mine somewhere, but I mean, uh, I'm, I, extremely, I, I'm glad you read that. I'm extremely excited about your algor algorithmic transparency bill. And so I had been. If you're in favor, I need you. I am. And uh, I That's actually it. emailed you about this. Um, and so I was keeping an eye out <laughs> to make sure that uh, the, this was actually a hearing that was available for public comment as not just you know us listening to interesting people saying interesting things. So thank you very much for clarifying in your tweet that it was uh, certainly available for public comment. Yeah, definitely, and um, I, I'm glad you came. And the algorithms bill I think is groundbreaking. I'm very much in favor of it, of course. I introduced it, but I imagine next, you would next month I hope you come back. Uh, I hope so too, I thank you. I hope you come back, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, there being no further witnesses, I want to thank everyone, the Borough President, all the stakeholders, and uh, the council staff, of, co of course, as always.
So it's now 2.30 p.m. and the hearing is now adjourned.